the Rock and Roll Unravel Show. I'm Derek Shelmerdine. Welcome to another Rock and Roll Unravel Show. We're going to take a look at the Vietnam War. It had a massive impact on the music of the 60s and 70s. We're going to look at the story of the conflict itself and some great songs from the era. Authors Doug Bradley and Craig Werner spent a decade interviewing Vietnam War veterans about which songs helped them get through the whole thing. And they were very surprised to find that the number one of the most mentioned songs by the vets had nothing at all to do with the Vietnam War. It was the animals, we gotta get out of this place, a sentiment felt by most of the soldiers in Vietnam most of the time. Well, they called their book that, and this is The Animals. We gotta get out of this place. We'll start by looking at how the war came about. Well, Vietnam became a French colony. It was part of Indochina, Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. And that was in the late 19th century. And then in 1940, France lost control to Japan after surrendering to Germany in World War II. And after the war, France resumed its colonial control of Vietnam. But in the meantime, Ho Chi Minh, a communist revolutionary, had organized a national force, the Viet Minh, to fight the Japanese. <laughs> and he continued that fight when the French returned. Well, it all ended for the French in 1954 with the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, when they were defeated by Ho Chi Minh's forces. Now, shortly after Ho Chi Minh's victory, there was a Geneva Agreement that divided Vietnam at the 17th parallel. And that created the communist North Vietnam and democratic South Vietnam, two different countries. Now they were promised a democratic election in a couple of years to potentially unify the country again, but that never happened. Now at the time of Dien Bien Phu, America was bankrolling the French and when France withdrew, America stepped up its involvement by sending in military advisers and they also funded South Vietnam's war effort against the North. Now America's motivation here was the fear of the domino effect. If Vietnam fell to communism, then they felt the rest of Southeast Asia surely would follow. The first American deaths came in July of 1959 when two military advisers were killed. And the first American involvement in direct combat came in the January of 62 when American pilots manned helicopters transporting over a thousand South Vietnamese paratroopers into an assault. Well, on the 22nd of November 1963, President John F. Kennedy was assassinated and Vice President Lyndon Baines Johnson took the helm. America's war in Vietnam really started in the August of 64 with the Gulf of Tonkin incident. It was actually only a brief skirmish, but as a result, Congress passed the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution and that authorised President Johnson to conduct military operations in Southeast Asia without a declaration of war. Well, the first bombing of North Vietnam followed a few days later and the notorious Operation Rolling Thunder bombing campaign started in the March of 65. It was initially planned to last eight weeks, but continued for the next three and a half years. The first combat troops arrived in the March of 65 in the shape of three and a half thousand United States Marines. Well, time for some music. And what more apt than a song called War? It started life as a Temptations album track on their 1970 album Psychedelic Shack, actually written by Barrett Strong and Norman Whitfield to Motown stalwarts. But it was Edwin Starr who had the the big hit on both sides of the Atlantic in that same year, 1970. But we're going to listen to a version from much later than that. Now, when Bruce Springsteen joined his first band, it was a New Jersey band called the Castiles in mid-65, Bart Haynes was the drummer. And shortly afterwards, Haynes split from the band to join the Marine Corps. And sadly, on the 22nd of October 1967, 19-year-old Lance Corporal Bard Haynes was killed by mortar fire in the Quang Tri province. Well, this version of War was recorded live at the Los Angeles Coliseum in 1985. And this is Bruce Springsteen and War. (laughs) 
Well, protests against the war started almost immediately. In the March of 65, there was the first teaching against the Vietnam War, and that was at the University of Michigan, soon spread across campuses throughout America. On the 7th of April, and these are all 1965, President Johnson delivered his Peace Without Conquest speech, we will not be defeated, we will not withdraw. Another big demonstration a couple of weeks later in Washington, organised by the SDS, that's the Students for a Democratic Society. They were very active as anti-war campaigners. And they, this demo was against the US bombings. And it had the support of fifteen to 25,000 people. Now, sources vary a lot for the uh, the figures on these things. And in the August, there was an attempt to clamp down on anti-war protesters when President Johnson signed into law the bill criminalising the burning of draft cards. Well, sort of back to the war, in the November, there was the battle at Ladrang Valley in the Central Highlands, and that was the first battle between American troops and North Vietnamese regulars. lasted a couple of days, the Northern troops withdrew, and that was the basis of the movie We Were Soldiers, 2002. Now Simon and Garfunkel have a great track called Seven O'Clock News Stroke Silent Night on their 1966 album Parsley, Sage, Rosemary and Time. And the newsreader in the background refers to Richard Nixon as the former vice president and he quotes Nixon talking about the war and what he says is opposition to the war in this country is the greatest single weapon working against America. Another prominent anti-war figure was David Harris, and in 67 he formed the anti-draft movement, the Resistance. This is the David Harris that married John Byers in 68, and none in 69 found him in prison with a three-year sentence for draft evasion. And of course Muhammad Ali, world-famous boxer, he was arrested in 67 for refusing to be conscripted into the army. Now, the draft was very unpopular, and a number of songs reflect this, including songs like uh, Creedence Clearwater Revival, 1969, with Fortunate Son. That was also very much against class privilege. And The Birds, in 1968, on their album Notorious Bird Brothers, they had a track called Draft Morning that includes the sound of gunfire. Now, Phil Oakes was one of the most active of the folk protest singers. He had some great songs, including I Ain't Marching Anymore, White Boots Marching in a Yellow Land, Talking Vietnam Blues. But the one we're going to listen to next is Phil Oakes with Draft Dodger Rag. You're listening to Derek Shelmadine with the Rock and Roll Unraveled Show. And we're looking at the soundtrack to the Vietnam War. But before continuing with the story, there's an opportunity to win a signed copy of my book, Rock and Roll Unraveled. Just check out the link on my homepage, rockandrollunraveled.com. There's a simple question, and you're in the draw. Now, Rock and Roll Unraveled tells a story of rock and roll from its roots to mid-1970s punk. It also looks at the social factors like the Vietnam War that influenced the music. Well, good luck with the competition. Meanwhile, back at the plot... It wasn't all anti-war back in America. On the 13th of May 1967, there was a pro-war demonstration with a march of 70,000 in New York led by Raymond Gimler, the New York City fire captain. America's strategy in the war was known as pacification and they target villages that were in areas controlled by the Viet Cong. They were South Vietnamese guerrilla forces, sympathetic to the north. The village would be bombed before search and destroy ground troops went in. And the idea was that the non-Viet Cong villagers would be protected. Self-defense forces set up, and America would then help to improve the lives of the villagers, all with the aim of winning hearts and minds. With the July of 68, the notorious Phoenix program was introduced, and that was established to crush the Viet Cong infrastructure in South Vietnam. And South Vietnamese and American intelligence officers would gather information on suspected guerrillas and then work to capture, convert, or kill them. Now, not all songs associated with the Vietnam War were actually anti-war Vietnam songs. Some were written about something else, but basically absorbed as Vietnam protest songs. Tracks like Creedence 
Clearwater Revival's Running Through the Jungle. That was actually written about gun control and the proliferation of guns. And particularly Steve Stills, for what it's worth, often referred to as an anti-Vietnam War song. But that was about the Sunset Strip riots in L.A. in the November of 1966. But back at the protests, John Byers was arrested in the October of 67 at a protest called Stop the Draft Week. Oh, and a couple of high-profile anti-war activists organised one of the strangest anti-war protests. On the 21st of October 67, Jerry Rubin led over 50,000 protesters in a march to levitate the Pentagon. Now, Abby Hoffman announced that the plan was to encircle the Pentagon and levitate it, to exorcise the evil spirits therein. Now, poets and rock band The Fugs were there in the crowd chanting, Out, demons, out! Out, demons, out! Now, protesters were met by a strong force of police and soldiers and resulted in more than 600 arrests. There were often singers at these things, and at this one you could hear Peter, Paul and Mary and Phil Oakes. And at the end of 1967, LBJ was still putting a positive spin on the progress in Vietnam, and in a speech... On the 24th of December, to some assembled troops, he told them, and I quote, The enemy cannot win now in Vietnam. All the challenges have been met. The enemy is not beaten, but he knows that he's met his master in the field. He is trying to buy time. Wow! Were things about to change? But before that, some more music. There was some music that was positive about the war. In 1966, you had Staff Sergeant Barry Sadler's the Green Berets, and in 1969, Mill Haggard sang about values held by Middle America. And this particular version of the song was recorded live in Muskogee, Oklahoma, in 1969. And this is Mill Haggard with a wonderful Oki from Muskogee. The turning point in the war came at the beginning of 1968. On the 21st of January, 20,000 North Vietnamese troops attacked the 6,000 Marines based at uh, Khe Sanh, and the siege of Khe Sanh was underway. And that continued until the 8th of April, when they were relieved by the forces of Operation Pegasus. But the real turning point came on the 31st of January, with the devastating Tet Offensive, when 80,000 Viet Cong, they were the South Vietnamese guerrilla fighters, aided by North Vietnamese regulars, simultaneously attacked over a hundred towns and cities across South Vietnam. It completely took the Americans by surprise. It was the first time street fighting had taken place in the cities. Some attacks were repulsed within hours, others days. Some targets, like the Battle for Hoi, saw fierce fighting that lasted for months. It was March when the Tet Offensive was finally halted, but public opinion turned very firmly against the war. And it was the beginning of the end for the American adventure in Vietnam. Now, there were lots of songs essentially lamenting the separation from loved ones. Um, A couple notable ones would be Donovan in 1969 with To Susan on the West Coast Waiting. In 1967, Normie Rowe released Going Home. Now, he's an Australian singer. And Australia, of course had uh, a lot of troops out there fighting in Vietnam. Now, fortunately, Harold Wilson, the UK Prime Minister at the time, wanted nothing to do with the war. And that was very fortunate for me personally, because I was exactly the right age and background to have been conscripted. Then came one of the most notorious incidents in the war. On the 16th of March 1968, the My Lai Massacre. That was a search and destroy mission into the My Lai Hamlet, and that was an operation in the Phoenix program. Now, intelligence reports had indicated enemy troops were taking refuge in the villages in the area. An assault on the village was led by Charlie Company Commander Captain Ernest Medina and 1st Platoon Leader Lieutenant William Kelly. Now, despite not finding any Viet Cong in the village, the US soldiers proceeded to massacre the villages. Over 300 and possibly as many as 500 civilians were killed. Now the facts of the Mai Lai massacre didn't emerge for another year. Vietnam veteran Ron Ridenauer learned about the events from conversations with some of the men from Charlie Company who were actually involved in the incident. 
<laughs> and to cut a very long story short, it was March of 69 when Ron Ridenour exposed the atrocity, and in 1970 a number of people were brought to trial, including Ernest Medina and William Calley, but only Calley was found guilty. He received a life sentence, but he was paroled in 1974 after a number of appeals. And our next piece of music is certainly one of the more obscure songs from the era. And this is C Company featuring Terry Nelson with Battle Hymn of Lieutenant Kelly. Now the demonstrations weren't just confined to America. They were happening across Europe during the course of the Vietnam War. And there was a really big one in the UK on the 17th of March 1968 with an anti-Vietnam demonstration in London's Grosvenor Square outside the American Embassy. Now, following the Tet Offensive, America knew it couldn't win the war. And on the 31st of March, President Johnson made a speech which began, Good evening, my fellow Americans. Tonight, I want to speak to you of peace in Vietnam and Southeast Asia. And he went on to explain how South Vietnam was taking over responsibility for the direct combat role. And that was called Vietnamization. And he concluded his speech with his decision not to stand for re-election. And he said, I shall not seek and will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. The Paris Peace Talks began on the 10th of May. And that was five years of on-off official peace talks. But interestingly enough, senior negotiator Henry Kissinger also conducted clandestine meetings alongside these official peace negotiations. Well, some months later, in the August of 1968, there was a massive riot at the Democratic Convention in Chicago. And as the rioting escalated across the four days of the convention, Mayor Richard Daly brought in reinforcements. And to put some context into this, the Chicago History Museum puts the numbers involved as, and I quote, in total 11,900 Chicago police plus 7,500 army regulars plus 7,500 Illinois National Guardsmen and 1,000 FBI and Secret Service agents were stationed in the city. In 1971, Graham Nash wrote the song Chicago, inspired by the 1968 Democrat Convention. Well, Pete Seeger had been in the authorities' sight since the 1950s. I mean, Pete Seeger was a very prolific folk singer. He was pro-trade union, very anti-war. And Senator Joe McCarthy had been conducting communist witch hunts throughout the 1950s. And in 1955, in fact, Pete Seeger appeared before the House Un-American Activities Committee. Well, he fell foul of the authorities once again in 1967. Now, on the 1st of September, Pete Seeger recorded his guest appearance on the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour, and part of his show included his song Waist Deep in the Big Muddy. But when the show was broadcast a week or so later, the song was edited out, because, of course, it was an anti-Vietnam War song. And to counter this injustice, the Smothers Brothers enlisted the aid of the press to highlight this blatant censorship. Well, they were successful. Seeger was invited back on the show five months later, and on the 25th of February 68, he performed the song on the show. The song itself, Waist Deep in the Big Muddy, was set in 1942, but it's very much a Vietnam anti-war song. In fact, there's a line in the song where the captain says, Don't be a nervous Nelly. Now, the term nervous Nelly was a phrase much loved by Lyndon Johnson to describe peaceniks and anti-war protesters. And in fact, he used the phrase in a speech on the 17th of May 1966 at a Democratic Party dinner in Chicago. And referring to the Vietnam War, he said, there will be some nervous Nellies. And from 1967, this is that Pete Seeger song, Waist Deep in the Big Muddy. You're listening to Derek Shelmerdine with the Rock and Roll Unraveled show and a look at the Vietnam War and the soundtrack to that era. Now, lots of bands and artists mentioned in the show have concert dates in the diary. 
To see the latest tour information, dates and venues, check out my website, rockandrollunraveled.com. And at the top, you'll see 1960s, 70s artists touring now. See which of your favourite artists have gigs planned. Well, back to the story. By 1969, morale was low, to say the least. And with continued troop withdrawals, it meant that soldiers often tried to avoid combat. And fragging, a name given to the practice of American soldiers deliberately killing their own unpopular officers and NCOs, particularly if it was felt that the officer was looking for promotion at their expense. On the 10th of May 1969, the 10-day Battle for Hill 937 commenced, and that was in the Orshaw Valley. The high-profile reporting of the carnage of this battle significantly shifted American public opinion even further against the war. And In fact, the battle was immortalised in John Irvin's 1987 Hollywood movie, Hamburger Hill. A number of songs were inspired by the violence in the war. Uh, Rolling Stone's Gimme Shelter, The Doors, Unknown Soldier. The new president, Richard Nixon, was inaugurated in the January of 69. And in the June, he authorised the first troop withdrawals. And that was approximately 25,000 men. But in mid-November 1969 came the biggest ever anti-war demonstration. And that was started with the March Against Death, with an estimated 45,000 protesters. And each protester carried a placard with the name of a soldier who'd been killed in the war, or a Vietnamese village that had been destroyed. And as they passed the White House, each person called out the name on their card of the dead soldier or the destroyed village. Now, the protest was immediately followed by the mobilization demonstration in Washington, and that had an estimated half a million protesters. There were speeches and protest songs from Pete Seeger, Arlo Guthrie, Peter, Paul and Mary. In fact, Pete Seeger led the crowd of half a million singing John Lennon's Give Peace a Chance. And John Lennon and the Plastic Ono Band, their happy Xmas, War is Over, gave them a... UK hit in 1972. On the 1st of May 1970, the ill-fated Kent State University demonstration started on the university campus. There were more demonstrations in the town and violence escalated across the weekend. And by Sunday, there were a thousand members of the National Guard on campus. It was the 4th of May when there was another campus demonstration and students yelled and threw stones at the National Guard and a small number of guardsmen responded by firing directly into the crowd and when the shooting stopped, four students were dead and another nine wounded. The events inspired Neil Young to write his song Ohio and this is the Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young version of Ohio. The war was drawing to a close. Well, for America, anyway. On the 5th of September 1970, there was the last engagement to use American ground forces and the last American Marine combat unit left Vietnam in mid-1971. The Paris Peace Accords were actually signed on the 27th of January 1973 and America's war in Vietnam was over. In the February, Operation Homecoming began, which was the repatriation of the 600 or so American POWs. It took about six weeks. And Marvin Gaye had a great Christmas single with I Want to Come Home for Christmas that was inspired by the plight of the POWs. That was recorded in 1972, but not actually released until 1990. A year earlier, of course, in 1971, he'd released the highly acclaimed What's Going On. And that song came about after Ronaldo Benson, now he's one of the four tops, witnessed police brutality at an anti-war demo in Barclay in the May of 69. And a really interesting one. The Nobel Peace Prize for 1973 went to US negotiator Henry Kissinger and North Vietnam's Le Duc Tho. Henry Kissinger accepted the award, but Lee Duc Tho, he rejected the award. In his view, the war was not over. On the 10th of March 1975, the inevitable invasion of South Vietnam began, and the final 55 days before the fall of Saigon and South Vietnam. 
The last Americans were airlifted out of Saigon on the 30th of April 75, and now the Vietnam War was over. The war might well have been over, but it continued to inspire songs for decades to come. 1982, The Clash had Straight to Hell, and that was about American fathered children abandoned in Vietnam. And 1985, Paul Hardcastle had a big hit with 19, and that was a load of statistics about the Vietnam War. And talking of statistics, to put this whole thing into context, the peak troop strength in Vietnam, and this would be April 69, was 543,482. The number of troops who passed through Vietnam during that era was over 9 million, 58,272 of which died. The Vietnamese deaths, the estimates there vary dramatically. Uh, from 2.1 million to 3.8 million people. Well, that's it. I've been Derek Shelmadine. You've been listening to the Rock and Roll Unravel Show and the story of the soundtrack to the Vietnam War. I hope you've enjoyed listening to the show half as much as I have been putting the whole thing together. If you're into social media, you can find me on Twitter at RNR Unraveled and Facebook at Rock and Roll Unraveled. And join me again next time for another look at some rock and roll unraveled now to play us out one of the great anthems this is the live version from the 1969 woodstock festival where it billed itself as three days of peace and music sit back and enjoy country joe mcdonald i feel like i'm fixing to die rag <laughs> 